topics I'm going to address, and I just need to get into my uh, presentation. Yeah. Good. Perfect. Thank you. So, um, uh, you know, why, why even talk about uh, risk reduction for prostate cancer? We've beaten this topic to death about the effects of mass uh, population screening. The big problem is that it poses a significant risk of overdiagnosis in the U.S. for sure. That's associated with overtreatment. We've been hearing all morning that treatment has side effects, and this overall strategy really is costly in human and economic terms. And I really think that prostate cancer is, is really the uh, poster child for, for a cancer that can be overdiagnosed. And there are many other cancers that are overdiagnosed, but prostate cancer may be the one most susceptible to that. And these are the three factors that promote overdiagnosis of cancer. And this was a very nice review article by Gil Welch uh, a few years ago. The first is the existence of a silent reservoir. We've been hearing all uh, in the last two or three days about the high proportion of uh, prostate cancers in black or white men in the United States. And yesterday, Dr. Zlata uh, gave us uh, some new information about the prevalence of autopsy prostate cancer in Asian men. So there is no question, there's a huge pool of prostate cancer waiting to be diagnosed. Now, a second factor that promotes overdiagnosis are activities that lead to its detection. For example, screening. So here's a slide from the United States, and this looks at Medicare beneficiaries. And these are men in the United States who are over the age of 65. And, and the Kaiser uh, Foundation, the Kaiser approach to medicine, is one that is being uh, uh, touted as, as, as an optimal way of practicing medicine in the United States. And what you can see is that among men who are over the age of 65, that about three quarters of them have been receiving PSA screening in the Kaiser uh, setting. Uh, Peter Albertson showed this slide a few days ago showing uh, another way of examining PSA screening in the United States. It's very high among men in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And remember, a randomized trial of radical prostatectomy was only positive for men in this age group. It was negative for men in this age group. And a screen-detected cancer is probably four to five years of lead time before a clinically detected cancer, as was studied in SPG4. So that would infer that we're, we're on an age basis screening the wrong population. We're probably screening the population in the wrong way. If you use a PSA threshold, for example, 40% of men in their 70s will be considered abnormal but yet that group of men has only a uh, 3 or 4 percent 10-year prostate cancer mortality. So we're labeling quite a large number of men uh, with the techniques that we've been using. And the final factor promoting overdiagnosis is a long natural history. And, and, and this is a kind of schematic that we've uh, seen several times before. There are some relatively fast-growing cancers that will actually kill the patients, but on the other hand, there are slow-growing or non-progressive cancers, and, and these are the kinds of cancers that men die with, and every one of those cancers would be overdiagnosed. And if we look at some contemporary studies from Gothenburg, after 14 years of follow-up, 30 times as many men died of something else as died of prostate cancer. If we look at the ERSPC from the paper that came out yesterday, 40 times as many men died of something else as died of prostate cancer. And in the United States, among men who had screen-detected, clinically localized prostate cancer, who were deemed suitable candidates for radical prostatectomy, this is the observation arm from the PIVOT trial, after 10 years of follow-up, five times as many men have died of something else rather than dying from prostate cancer. So there's a terrific opportunity for men to die of something else. And we've seen slides like this for the last few days. The magnitude of overdiagnosis can be estimated by comparing the screened and the usual care arms. Depending how you slice and dice it in PLCO, 
the screened men had 2.7 times as many cancers as a pre-PSA population, 1.6 times as a contemporary American population, and 1.2 times the control population. In the ERSPC, the, uh, it was a 70% increase. This is using the 2009 data in the screen versus the control. And in the Gothenburg study, 64% more cancers in the screened arm. So there's a lot of overdiagnosis going on. And remember, the Gothenburg trial is the most positive screening trial there is. And as we said the other day, uh, there, if you followed 1,000 men for 14 years, there's only five men who, whose prostate cancer death was averted. But during those period of time, you would have diagnosed 127 men with prostate cancer. So there's a lot more men being diagnosed than who are benefiting from screening. Now the impact of overdiagnosis is, the, the road to overdiagnosis is costly in terms of the PSA test, PSA anxiety, and we heard about the biopsy associated issues. But once the cancer is diagnosed, there are many more significant costs, and that's where the real problems start. Nice study from Scandinavia showing the rate of major cardiac events uh, occurring within one week or one month of the diagnosis of prostate cancer, even in men who did not have a history of underlying cardiac disease. And even the rate of suicide uh, rises in these men who are told that they have this diagnosis of what is often indolent prostate cancer. But the real cost is overtreatment. And in the United States, in PLCO, 91% of, of the cancers are treated. In a community study of um, uh, patients on the west coast of the United States, 92.5% of patients received aggressive treatment. This paper looked at all of the PSA detected prostate cancers during the first 20 years of PSA testing in the United States. And, and uh, uh, Peter Albertson and Gil Welch estimated that there were 1.3 PSA detected cancers during the first 20 years and that one million of them, 80%, received aggressive therapy with either surgery or radiation. Yet another way of looking at cancer registry data and estimating overtreatment of prostate cancer, even for men with low-risk prostate cancer, in their 60s, only 4% receive watchful waiting. And in the United States, even among men who are over the age of 75, with a low-risk tumor, only 21% of such men receive uh, watchful waiting. So we are really guilty of substantial overtreatments. So one way of averting the, this overdiagnosis and overtreatment is either to screen better, which we've been talking about, or I think to uh, engage in prostate cancer risk reduction. And there are a number of plausible uh, agents that have been looked at, uh, many of them in, in um, uh, randomized controlled uh, trials. Sadly, uh, the, the data we have from all of these trials isn't that compelling. If you look at all of the, ver the various nutritional approaches to reducing the chance of a prostate cancer diagnosis, you can see on the, on the forest plot that it really does not make a significant difference in a man's detection for prostate cancer. One very large study looked at selenium and vitamin E, and you can see that uh, after 10 years of follow-up, there was no difference in, in the rate of prostate cancer, but with even further follow-up in the vitamin E, there was this paradoxical effect where there was a 17% increase in the diagnosis of prostate cancer, which, which to this day remains unexplained. The point of this is to say that vitamin E, selenium, those nutritional approaches really have not panned out as plausible risk reduction strategies. Now, what about the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors? Everyone is familiar with the PCPT trial. Everyone is aware that there is a 25% risk reduction for uh, prostate cancer, and, and Ian reported this now close to 10 years ago. This study, very heavily criticized uh, for its very high detection rate in the low-risk population that was under study. It was criticized because there were fewer four-cause biopsies in the finasteride arm, and it was really heavily criticized because there were more high-grade Gleason 7 and above cancers on biopsy in the finasteride arm. Now, mo many people believe that this was an artifact, 
of, of, uh, of a number of biases against finasteride, the most important one being the volume bias. And that sort of says that a prostate that's smaller as a result of finasteride treatment, in that prostate, a given needle biopsy is more likely to be positive and more likely to assign the correct Gleason score. Now, a number of independent groups have looked at their PCPT data and adjusted for the biases against finasteride. And in all four of these models, you can see that the excess, the 27% excess Gleason 7 to 10 in the raw data disappears if you adjust for the impact of bias, mostly volume bias, but to some extent PSA bias. And it was for that reason that two years ago, the AUA and ASCO together recommended that we should be encouraged to talk to our patients about using 5-alpha uh, reductase inhibitors. Now, about a year ago, Ian uh, and I went to the FDA to talk about our studies. And uh, the FDA, however, did their own modeling to explain the impact of prostate volume derived from a number of different approaches. And in their analysis, they could make the Gleason 7 to 10 disappear, but they could not make in this one model the Gleason 8 to 10 disappear. So they said there's a signal that we may actually be promoting the development of Gleason 8 to 10 cancer. Now, while all of that was occurring, we did the reduced trial, and, and dutasteride, as, as many of you know, may be a better 5-alpha reductase inhibitor for risk reduction because in inhibiting both type 1 and type 2, it, 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 it inhibits uh, more of the 5-alpha uh, reductase enzyme that is in the cancer cells that are within the prostate. And, and this may be something we've already observed in the BPH studies. PLESS and MTOPS looked at finasteride, fewer cases uh, in, in the finasteride arm than the placebo arm, but in, in two of the largest dutasteride studies, there were statistically significant reductions in the clinical rates of prostate cancer. So we performed the uh, reduced trial, which was a little different from PCPT, in that we studied men who had PSAs between 2.5 and 10. The unique feature of our study and what got us in trouble is the fact that we encouraged two biopsies on the trial. And this is where the problem comes in for reduce, and I'll show you that. Because if we had stopped after the first biopsy, there would have been no issue at all. There was this 22% risk reduction for the diagnosis of prostate cancer during the first two years of dutasteride therapy. The problem came in because we re-biopsied the men who had negative biopsies a second time on the trial. And, and, and what we didn't think about in advance was that during the second two years of the reduced trial, years three and four, that the populations were very imbalanced. And the way I look at it now is that at the initial randomization, there should have been an equal number of small volume cancers in each arm. And that during the first round of biopsies, we actually found 142 more cancers in the placebo arm. So as the population remaining in the study enters the third and fourth year, there were actually more men remaining in the dutasteride arm and very likely more cancers waiting to be discovered in the dutasteride arm. And that made the populations very imbalanced. But despite those imbalances, we still found fewer prostate cancers in years three and four of the reduced trial. And, th and this was a very strong uh, argument against some of the criticisms of PCPT, because during this particular round of biopsies, even though there were more cancers likely waiting to be detected, even though there were more men undergoing biopsy, and even though the prostates were now a third smaller, we still found fewer cancers. So that was a good thing. The bad thing was that the cancers we discovered during that second round accounted for this small numerical increase in Gleason 8 to 10 cancers in, in the dutasteride arm. And I'd just like to spend a minute looking at this. During the randomized part of the reduced trial, years one and two, absolutely identical Gleason 8 to 10 cancers. All of the excess 8 to 10 cancers occurred during the second round of biopsies. And the puzzling thing is not that there was an increase in the rate of Gleason 8 to 10 in the dutasteride arm, but rather there were virtually no Gleason 8 to 10s 
in the placebo arm. And why is that? Well, I think if we look back here at the 141 more men who were removed from the study in the placebo group because they had Gleason 5 to 7 cancer, just ask yourself the question, how many of these 141 men actually harbored biopsy-detectable Gleason 8 to 10 cancers? Admittedly, our needle biopsy didn't hit the 8 to 10 elements, but there have to be some Gleason 8 to 10 elements in those patients. And we took some data from the Toronto uh, Active Surveillance uh, Protocol, which rebiopsied men. It was one of the few biopsy studies that had included active surveillance for men who had up to Gleason 7 cancer. In this population, on the, on the second uh, biopsy, 8% of the men were found to have Gleason 8 to 10 cancers on rebiopsy. So we very simply would say, of the 141 excess Gleason five to seven cancers, based on the Toronto data, 8% of them should actually harbor Gleason eight to 10 tumors. So if you give 11 tumors on account of that, the number of Gleason eight to 10 tumors overall would be identical between the two groups. Just hold that thought because the FDA has another opinion. What about volume reduction in the reduced trial? The reduced trial, the schematic should look a little bit like this. We know that these patients, some of these patients at baseline, had very small uh, Gleason 3 and 4 cancers, <coughs> pardon me, scattered throughout their prostate. As a result of dutasteride therapy, we know that it shrinks the prostate. But we also did a number of pre-radical prostatectomy studies which show that the pattern 3 cancers shrink by about 40%. So that after dutasteride therapy, not only is the prostate smaller, but we've probably eliminated a lot of the volume of the pattern three cancers, making it more likely that we're going to detect some pattern four on biopsy. And so when we uh, did our model and we included uh, prostate size at the time of biopsy, we would actually have anticipated a statistically significant reduction in Gleason 7 to 10 cancers, if you account for that. And I should also just say that in all the randomized studies we have where, where the populations were truly randomized, there's no increase in Gleason 7, 8, and 9 in, in uh, patients who received dutasteride. And that was true for the REDEEM study and also for the COMBAT study. The Cochrane evaluation thought that 5-alpha reductase were a good thing. But here's where the problem came in. This is the FDA's analysis of the data. And what they did here in the REDUCE study, uh, David Bostwick was our reference pathologist. He used the classic Gleason score. The FDA asked uh, Scott Lucia to reread the REDUCE cancers uh, using the same criteria he used when he labeled the Gleason scores of the PCPT cancers. And when he did that, instead of there being 29 high grade cancers in the dutasteride arm, and uh, 19 in the placebo arm, it turned out there were 16 in the placebo arm and 32 in, in the uh, dutasteride arm, so nearly twice as many. And so when the FDA did its model to adjust for the excess uh, Gleason 8 to 10, uh, they, they could not show that, that the uh, excess 8 to 10 went away when they used the modified Gleason score. When they were using the classic Gleason score that Boswick used, there was no issue with the 8 to 10. And furthermore, I should say the FDA didn't like our explanation of, of the missed Gleason 8 to 10 elements in, in the biopsy. And that's why from the FDA's perspective, they don't recommend 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. They're concerned that using them could be associated with one additional high-grade cancer, and by that they mean 8 to 10, in order to avert three to four potentially clinically relevant low-grade cancers. So they thought the trade-off was not a very uh, valid one, and that's why they've recommended against 5-alpha reductase for prevention in the United States. Just recently, um, in the British uh, uh, literature, there was a 14 years retrospective study of men who had received 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, and you can see that there were slightly fewer cancers in the men who took 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, but there was no difference in, in the Gleason score, even with 14 years 
of, uh, of 5 alpha reductase inhibitors. Now, I wanted to segue just a little bit to cost because this intervention, were it to have been approved, is actually a pretty uh, cost-effective uh, intervention. And I think this is important because in the United States, it, just because of the aging population, the cost of caring for prostate cancer is going to increase by 42% within the next decade. And that's if we practice medicine the same way in year 2020 as we did in 2010. The problem is we're always changing. So uh, American urologists have added the use of IMRT instead of 3D conformal therapy uh, very avidly. And, and the cost of, of using IMRT versus 3D conformal therapy is $360 million per year. And by the way, there's no randomized trial showing that it's any better. And we're now on the cusp in the United States of proton therapy, which is about two times as expensive as IMRT. So the costs are going to go up. Now, American doctors and American patients are sort of addicted to gizmos. And you can see in this kind of clever paper that was written a few years ago, the reasons why patients and doctors like to use the latest gadget, and they called it a gizmo. And, and if every case in the United States that could be done robotically were, the added cost would be $1.5 to $2.5 billion per year. And we don't have that money. And this is despite the fact that, of a paper that just came out in the Journal of Clinical uh, uh, Oncology uh, that uh, the headline in the popular press was don't believe the hype about robotic prostatectomy. Older men considering robotic surgery shouldn't trust the rosy ads promoting the expensive technology over low-tech surgery because there was no benefit to robotic surgery and any side effects in relation to open surgery. And the medical oncologists aren't far behind. So, so there's now a number of uh, good treatments on the basis of randomized trials that add uh, three to five months of extra life to a man with prostate cancer. And here are the costs of those treatments, the big one being Provenge. And since they, Provenge only adds about uh, four months to your life, the cost per year of life added is extraordinarily high. Now, right now, those treatments are approved only for these men who have non-metastatic castrate-resistant or symptomatic castrate-resistant metastatic disease. What's going to happen is that those treatments are going to be applied to this much larger population of patients for whom there is no phase three randomized good data, and the costs are going to balloon enormously. So I think we all have a responsibility, urologists, radiation oncologists, and uh, medical oncologists to do something different. From my perspective, I think prostate cancer risk reduction with 5-alpha reductase are warranted. The main reason is to reduce overdetection and overtreatment. I didn't talk about it, but it makes PSA a better biomarker. Uh, it prevents BPH. I don't think it promotes aggressive cancer. And I think if we found the highest risk population to treat, that it would be even more cost effective than, than the initial analysis we did. So many thanks uh, for, uh, for your kind attention. Well, thanks for this really great lectures. Are there any questions? Well, I have a question. Do you think the 5 alpha reductor story for um, prevention of prostate cancer is over, or will the FDA consider their statement? I, I think it's dead in the United States. I think that in addition to the lingering concerns about biopsy high-grade cancer, and by the way, that's biopsy high-grade cancer, we now have data from the REDUCE study that among men who had a radical prostatectomy, there's absolutely no difference. But uh, in part because of the high grade, and in part because they sort of tacitly said, American patients, American family doctors, and American urologists aren't smart enough to use PSA differently. So, so uh, they were concerned that patients and doctors would see that a man who took a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor had low PSAs, they would forget to double it, they would forget to look at rise off nadir, and, and this would give everybody a false sense of security and that the results are even going to be worse. And so it's for those two kind of high-level concerns that I think the FDA will never reconsider 
what they said, but I think they're wrong. Okay, good. Yeah. Any questions? So. Okay. so if this is not the case, well, thank you very much, and it's time for a coffee break.